Hi, this is Jeff Altman, The Big Game Hunter, and you're either watching Job Search TV or listening to No BS Job Search Advice Radio. I like to spend some time daily talking about some aspect of life, the universe, everything, helping you find work more quickly because to me, it doesn't have to be as hard, difficult, painful, or take as long as it does. Just a completely different skill set to find a job than do a job. And from time to time, I bring people on the show who have an expertise that I don't have. And today we have Chef Sean Boucher. He, Sean is a food service consultant and the owner of multiple food-related businesses with more than 25 years of experience. He's the author of the First Timers Cookbook and Bake Book and his latest book, Food People Management. Sean, thank you for making time today. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. So how did you get into culinary arts, food services? What's your story about this? Well, I definitely took an, a very non-traditional approach. You know, a lot of people really know that's what they want to do and they, they move right into it. And for me, it was very different because I really like to create. I like to do things with my hands. I like to step back and say, wow, I made that. And in high school, I had taken all the art classes I could, uh, whether it was ceramics or drawing or painting or whatever. And my guidance counselor said, you know, you ought to look at a trade college. It's just up the road. We'll pay for it. You get high school credit, college credit. And I thought, yeah, why not? So I looked through the course catalog and in there it had culinary art. So I was like, well, perfect. It's an art class. I'll be doing watermelon carvings and ice sculptures. And this is <laughs> going to be great. <laughs> so obviously I get in there the first day and the, the instructor's like, okay, time for lunch for 200 people in the next three hours. And I thought, oh man, what did I get myself into? But I ended up being good at it. I ended up sticking with it. And, you know, through the course of that, I was able to move into apprenticeships and, and work in different aspects of the industry and really kind of figure out where I wanted to end up. And, you know, that's, that's very untraditional. A lot of people, they kind of go into one thing and they stick there for a little while. And for me, I know, I, I just knew myself, I needed to jump around to a few things and really see where it was that I was going to fit. And it's interesting. I have friends in, in the restaurant business in New York, uh, you know, owners of great restaurants, executive chefs or former executive chefs of great restaurants. So I always think about a restaurant. Uh, and thus, when I was talking to someone near and dear to me about his interest in culinary arts, psst, my son, uh, mm -hmm. and trying to help him into a culinary program. I introduced him to one of the chefs uh, and he offered some guidance, but now he's out of school and thinking about, yeah, there's other stuff I might rather do than just be up till two in the morning every night. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it can be brutal. I mean, that, that's a big part of really what changed for me. Now I spent, I spent 12 years in operations day in, day out, um, you know, working every night, weekend, holiday, uh, you know, and, and really just spending the, the 60 plus hours on my feet at 29, I had that back surgery and I, I really, that kind of changed things for me. I had to recreate myself. I had to go back to school. I had to finish degrees and things because I just, I had to find a new role within the industry that wasn't going to force me to be on my feet all day, every day. Plus I was starting a family and I wanted to be there for them and not have to just be working all the time. So for you, it became, you know, health issues that started to take you out of the kitchen. Uh, that was kind of the initial catalyst. Um, and that was, I had been thinking about it for a long time. I had tried to get out of the business a few times. I tried to get into real estate in 2008 and Obviously, we know what happened in 2008, and it just wasn't meant to be. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, the, the un underlying thing here was that I was always very passionate about this industry. I was passionate about food. I was passionate about cooking. I was passionate about education. And that's where I ended up moving to is getting out of the day-to-day -day in the kitchen and moving into a, an instructor role. So I, I taught culinary school for a few years. And that led into uh, consulting, which essentially is educating, and that's kind of where 
it's led me to today. And when students go to a culinary school, are they kind of like my son with the expectation of going into a restaurant? Or are they really thinking about the breadth of the industry and they're just shocked into what it's going to actually really be like? <laughs> yes, uh, there is. I think there's a lot of deer in the headlights kind of reactions that that uh, when the students come in, the, the problem is, is, you know, when I got in this business 25 years ago, it was not quite as glamorous as it is now chefs weren't the rock stars then that they are now and so there were there's a perception among a lot of the young people especially that i'm going to get in this business and people are going to just you know fawn all over me and and it's going to be nothing but fun and you know i'm going to be creative all the time the reality is is it's still a brigade system so you still have to start at the bottom and work your way up. So regardless of whether you go get a degree at a culinary school, you still have to prove yourself. You still have to make sure that that's what you want to do. And that's the advice I give to not only students, but just people I run into is first and foremost, figure out if this is really what you want to do. Because if you go and you spend all this money on a culinary education and then get out and realize that, man, this really isn't what I want to do, then you're a little bit behind the eight ball. Now you're saddled with, with debt or you've spent all this money on an education that you're potentially not going to use. But if you get in the kitchen and work as a, as a hostess, as a busboy, as a server, as a cook, you know, whatever role or capacity that, that you can get into initially, um, you really get a sense for what it's going to be because initially at least there is a lot of nights, weekends and holidays, and there is a lot of proving yourself, before you can move into some of these other careers. I was very fortunate in that I recognized that the chefs who really got ahead had both experience and education, but they also had kind of a vision of who they wanted to be and what they wanted to do because they had, they had jumped around a lot. They had gone to hotels or they had gone to restaurants, they had gone to country clubs or hospitals, and they had kind of gotten an overall perspective of what the industry was and then they were able to craft a path forward from there. And so that's what I tell young people today or anybody who even is wanting to change careers because there's a lot of people that want to go from being an architect or an accountant or whatever into being in food. It's a very, very different mindset, very, very different skill set. I mean, just it's very different. And so you get, you get this culture shock initially. But if you've worked in a hotel or worked in a restaurant, worked in some sort of food service outlet, you get the pace, you get the hours, you get the, the, the different demands. And then from there, you can kind of craft it, uh, the path that you want to take. So if someone were looking for, I'm going to start with fast, am I best off looking at fast paced and then going to slow paced or just looking at options in general in our conversation? That's, that's a great point. I mean, I think uh, the nice thing about the hospitality industry is, is a double-edged sword for those of us in it. We're always hiring and we're always short staff. We can always use more people. And so the chances of somebody getting into this business are very, very high. The, the downside to that is, unfortunately, in this, this industry, we have a lot of people that have to work here versus want to work here. You know, people that have very little education or very little experience in other segments. And so they come to us because they can't get a job anywhere else. And it's very, very difficult as a manager or as somebody who wants to be in this business to manage people who have to be there versus want to be there. It's a very, very different mindset, very different to motivate people who feel like they're trapped. And so if you're wanting to get in the industry, the great news is, is that there's tons of opportunities and lots of ways to get in. What I would say is that you don't know what you don't know. So take what you can get and then kind of do that due diligence while you're there. If you get in as, as a dishwasher, even part-time, you're going to see what other people are doing in the kitchen or in the establishment. And you're going to be able to say, you know, my skills, I can do this, but my skill set is really that. Maybe I like that more. I've had tons of people that say, well, I want to come in, I want to be a cook, but they have these incredible dynamic personalities and they really don't want to work the hours that some of the cooks have to work. And so they, they gravitate more towards the front of the house and they gravitate more towards taking care of people and interacting with guests. Others get into it thinking, well, if I just want to work 
part time and I don't I don't want to have to put in the hours, but I also don't want to deal with people. And so they they end up getting in, yeah, as a as maybe a busser or something, but then moving more towards the back of the house because they don't have to deal with people. But those are things that you don't really know about yourself until you're put into certain situations. I was the type of person initially that did not want to manage conflict. I did not want to get into sticky situations where I was having to either either compensate guests or I was having to apologize for some of these mistakes. I was the guy that wanted to just hide in the back. But what I realized was that the more I dealt with conflict and the more I, I was able to work through those things, the better I got at it. And then I started to gravitate more towards management and more towards some of the front of the house operations. So your, your career is always going to evolve. You're always going to start somewhere and probably end up somewhere else. There's very, very few of us that are going to stay in the same role or, or stay in the same skill set or mindset that whole time because as we grow and develop, our careers will grow and develop with us. So my suggestion or my advice to anybody getting in is just get in, just start, and then you'll kind of be able to see where you want to go from there. But the great thing is, is that there's a lot more opportunities today than there ever was before. So for the person who's finishing a culinary program, so they've gotten the, um, the interest in the field, they've done their externship, and they've now discovered, I'm not sure a restaurant's really right for me. What do they do with all of this? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a great question. And I think more people today are in that boat. Like I said, the great news is, is that there's a lot of options. You know, uh, food writing has become very, very big. We have a cultural shift from, you know, when I got in this business, it was the Wizard of Oz. Nobody cared what was behind the curtain, just as long as food came out and it tasted okay. Nowadays, the presentation of it and making it Instagrammable is almost more important than the taste in some cases because people eat with their eyes first. And that's the society we live in. We're sharing food. We're, we're sharing pictures of what we eat. We're sharing where we're at, you know, and, and we're, we have this global network that's very interested in that. And so you have a, you have a whole different skill set there. Whereas if you learn how to cook, you may not be the greatest writer. But now it's almost like if you learn to cook and you can write, you can start a blog, you can start a YouTube channel, you, you have all these different mediums to be able to go and, and craft a brand or, or share a message that, uh, that is unique to you without having to wait for something to happen. You can be very proactive in making those things happen. You've also got a lot of things happening in the grocery space right now. They, the new term out there is grocerant. So you have grocery stores that are turning more into restaurants. The great thing about grocery stores is that in a restaurant setting, you kind of end up with that restaurant bar kind of kind of crowd or or hours. And so you're you're open from 11 a.m. until 2 a.m. And somebody's got to cover those shifts. Somebody's got to work those hours. With the grocery stores, after about 8 9 p.m., things are things are pretty well done for. And so I know a lot of people that have migrated more into the grocery space um, to, to have a little bit lesser impact on those late night hours, but still be able to um, still be able to offer high quality food. Now, the food that they're offering is definitely um, less all a minute. It's, it's more, you know, you're filling deli cases, you're, you're selling more things retail, but that's a little bit slower pace than having a ticket come in and having three minutes to get it out. Now you're doing more bulk things and you're able to do it in a, in a little bit slower setting to where you don't have quite those, you know, demands on you got to get this, got to get this, got to get this need food in the window. So those, those are a couple of options there. You can even move more into manufacturing. Now there's a lot of opportunities of people actually manufacturing food. And I'll give you an example. I was in Portland yesterday and there's a well-known ice cream concept called salt and straw. And Salt and Straw really built a name for themselves by doing small batch ice creams. Well, one of the things they've done to differentiate themselves is they're now packaging that ice cream and selling it in some of the specialty markets in, in like the Portland airport. So now it, they've migrated from being this, this single location restaurant into being more of a food manufacturer. Now they're selling retail. So their business has evolved and that's created opportunities to where you know, you might have 
if you first started working there, you might have started off as a chef creating those initial recipes. And now it's migrated more towards you're making deals with, with buyers on, in, in these distributing houses. Again, totally different skill sets, but there's just a lot of opportunity in food nowadays that, that is for those who are educated and experienced, there's a lot of opportunities that aren't the traditional restaurant world. You're not, you're not confined to one location. You have the ability to really spread your wings and flex different mu uh, muscles and skill sets. So just to be clear, I'm going to back up just a touch in the, um, the grocery setting. Is that really the hot bar or are there actual restaurants that are being put into the, uh, in, into the grocery facility? Well, I've, I have seen actual restaurants in there that, that are doing table service, but I've also seen the majority of it is more uh, kind of the fast casual model where people, where people will walk up to the counter and place their order and someone will make it and then and give it to them uh, right away. Gotcha. So I, I tend to think of the Whole Foods example of you're going over, uh, you're, you know, you're saying, I want these four items in my stir fry. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Stir fries, deli sandwiches, those are all burritos. Those are all, you know, hot button items right now. Rice bowls, noodle bowls, mm -hmm. you know, very customizable because that's, that's really what fast casual is about is a high, higher quality ingredient that's very customizable. And what kind of comp does someone make? And, and what part of the country would you be answering that question from? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, I have a, a little bit different perspective because I get to go everywhere. I get to go east to west and I see a lot of different segments in a lot of different places. And that's what I always tell people. The only advantage I have as a consultant is I just get to see a lot of things. With that experience, I would say that obviously on the coastal regions, you're going to be making more, but your living expenses are going to be more also. Whereas, you know, getting more towards the center of the country and, and even into the south, your living expenses are going to be less, but you're also going to be making a little bit less. So right now for a restaurant manager, you're probably for a single unit, you're probably somewhere in the neighborhood of between 40 and $60,000 mm -hmm. a year. Now that's going to be that's going to be very generic and that's going to be kind of based on volumes, but that's kind of just the, the general 40 to 60, uh, you know, one unit management. Now, if you get into the multi-unit management, you're going to jump up 20, 30%. So you're going to be closer to that, you know, 80,000 range uh, when it comes to being that base compensation. Now, restaurants are very, very numbers driven especially when it comes into multi-units and chains. And so a lot of compensation is based on performance, whether that's a share of profits or, you know, by hitting certain labor costs and food costs, you're getting some sort of incentive there. So people are really incentivized and you, depending on those compensation models, you can make a lot more money. I mean, I, I worked with a, with a regional chain that incentivized their managers uh, pretty heavily to perform. And we had managers that were making almost 50% of their salary and bonuses. So if you're really good at what you do, the, the limit on what you can make is, is exponential. I mean, you can really do very well. But the, the downside is, is a lot of recruiters and a lot of the people that try to get people into culinary school, they paint this picture that you're going to get out and you're going to be making eighty dollars to $100,000. It's really only about the top. 10% of earners out there in the restaurant business are making $100,000 or more. That's very, it's not typical in this industry, mostly because the margins are so low. You know, we generally go by a 30% food cost, 30% labor cost, 30% overhead, and that only leaves that 10% of profit. And so that that's really hard to pull a lot of money out of that, um, you know, with those margins. It's funny, a friend of mine, I, I mentioned to you the other day, was an executive chef at a restaurant. And at the point, uh, you know, he's in his 60s now, uh, and, you know, had been a celebrity chef for quite some time. And with that, uh, he still wasn't quite able to retire. It was not until uh, they had a second business where he was given equity in that, that private equity moved in on, that he was able to get the money to be able to live the life that he wanted outside of 
the back of the house. So I get it. That's very, and, and unfortunately it's very typical. It's, you know, it's something that uh, people always ask me, would you want to do your own restaurant? And I've, I've had my own restaurant I've had a franchise and I've been on both sides of the coin there. And for me, seeing what I've seen, I love being able to create restaurants, but I would not own my own restaurant again, as long as I have to depend on it for income because the business is so fickle and is so challenging. Um, it just makes it very, very difficult to, to be able to make ends meet. Now, what I've seen out there kind of going along the lines of your friend is, uh, yes, when chefs start getting into their later 50s and early 60s and retirement and benefits start becoming very, very important. And we're seeing that shift earlier. People are starting to get wiser to that uh, earlier now and, and demanding the benefits that, that they need as far as retirement and health care. And so what I see is a lot of times those chefs, when, when they're done making a name for themselves, when they're done with the TV appearances and they're done with the, the competitions and the awards, they're ready to more for kind of that retirement, pre-retirement lifestyle, we'll say. Um, they move more into hospitals. They move more into healthcare. They move more into corporate roles where it's not as demanding of them day in and day out. They, they can kind of step back, they can make a little bit better living and they can really have those benefits to, to fall back on. And, and honestly, truth be told, that's kind of where I ended up at at 29 after having my back surgery and realizing that healthcare was never going to get cheaper. My family was only going to get bigger, which meant it was going to get more expensive and I was going to need more time. And so I needed to find a way to do that. And that was why I gravitated more towards the larger corporations um, that were, that had more of that stability and those benefits. So we've been generally speaking about management jobs with a couple of exceptions uh, for someone who moves into corporate space or government or hospitals, what kind of roles exist for them in those areas? That's a great question. You know, um, again, talking about adapting your career and evolving and creating something um, totally different. I know a lot of chefs that have actually moved out of the kitchen and have moved more into like vice president roles and, and kind of overseeing multiple departments, especially within uh, either hotels or, or hospitals where there's these multifaceted positions that pay more and, and have more of that quality of life. Once you prove yourself, and I always tell people this when it comes to management, if you can manage this, then you can move to managing this, then you can move to managing this, but don't start here. You've got to start here. And, and a lot of corporations have that same mentality that if you can run a kitchen and food service very, very well, then chances are you can run other departments and other facilities well also. And, you know, that's the advantage of food services. Food service is so multifaceted. I mean, not only are we, we're, we're a manufacturing business because we're creating food and sending it out. We're retail business because we're selling products retail a lot of times in some of those spaces. We have to know marketing. So we become kind of these marketing entities of, of branding ourselves and creating some of these things. We have to know logistics. We have to know cost of goods sold. We, we have to know all these general business principles, but we have to do it in a setting with product that's perishable, uh, employees that aren't always the highly trained, skilled employees. You know, a lot of times it's people right off the street. So we're having to do a lot of different things kind of with our hands tied behind our backs. And so I see a lot of chefs that once they really learn all these principles and excel in the kitchen, they move into some of these other areas like housekeeping or um, like in hospitals, they'll move into housekeeping, they'll move into patient transport, they'll move into, um, you know, some of the scheduling and, and telephone departments. And, and they kind of look at it and they take all this stuff on and people go, wow, how do you take all this stuff on? And and really, it's just like running a kitchen. You know, you're having to run the front of the house staff. You're having to run the back of the house staff. You're having to worry about, you know, the distributor coming in on time and bringing your deliveries. You're having to worry about all these different things. And so managing all these departments is a very, very similar skill set. So a lot, of, a lot of chefs actually move out of the kitchen and into these upper echelon roles that are, are more than just food a lot of times. 
and and you know you can do that with larger companies uh, larger companies I've found and especially even the government with the VA hospitals and the in the different system there if you're good at your job and you prove yourself they will give you one two three even four more departments one of my clients recently not only was he running food service, he was the director of food service, but he was also the director of HR concur concurrently. So <laughs> that's a very different skill set, running HR and food service all at the same time. But because of his success um, and his dedication, he was able to do it and he was able to be compensated very well for it. So for the person uh, who was in your classes when you were teaching and suddenly they wake up one day and go, holy cow, this is not exactly what I thought it was. What do they do next? Because I know they didn't go into running a hospital and their food service. You know, they may have had um, a six-month course at that point. What do they do next? Well, that's a great question, you know, and that's, that's the challenge. The challenge is, you know, what do I do if this isn't really what I want to do? And I think, you know, that I don't think that's primarily a food service um, challenge. No. I mean, in this setting, it definitely is. I think most people come to a realization sometimes later in life that maybe this really isn't what I want to do and I want to change careers. I mean, my father-in-law was one of them. He, he became, he went from working um, in, in kind of these computer and, and manufacturing facilities into nursing. And he became a, a nurse later on in life and is very passionate about it and wishes he had found it sooner. But I think in food service, for those people that get in and they start down that path, you know, I was told to get in, I go to culinary school. What I always tell people is, you know, start, start here and grow here. So if, if you want to go to school, go to a trade college where your bill is going to be two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000, not fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. do not get straddled with all this debt from the get-go because you're going to get out and make 10, 12 bucks an hour. And how do you survive paying a thousand dollars a month in student loans on 10, 12 bucks an hour? You just can't. And so, you know, I, what I, my advice for anybody who gets in that situation is to, you can either be proactive or reactive to be proactive, which is ideal, you know, get that little base level of experience, get kind of the introductory education, make sure that's what you want to do. If it's not, then you kind of cut your losses and move on and you're able to do it without a lot of harm done um, or a lot of time wasted or a lot of money spent. If you, if you go down that path and you spend a lot of money and you kind of have to react, you can still find different opportunities out there. There's a lot of people, um, food brokers, for example, food brokers are always looking for people to come work trade shows and, and kind of sell their products. So maybe Maybe you don't have the skill set of, of cooking on the line really, really quickly, but you're very personable and you want to you wanna sell stuff. Well, you can go work for Simplot or Tyson or, you know, these big manufacturers or any one of these brokers uh, that, that kind of represents their products and, and travel around and do some of that. There's a lot of different options out there for you to, to look at. You kind of just have to step outside the box, though, and and you know, realize that there are opportunities, you just have to network and ask around about them because the more you network, regardless of whether it's this business or another one, you're gonna find opportunities or they're gonna find you. So food brokers is one option where you're appearing at trade shows or you're that person at, at the store who's prepping food mm -hmm. for everyone. Uh, try a little taste of such and such. I have that right? Absolutely. That's, I mean, there's opportunities there. You can go work for food distributors um, and essentially take customers' orders. So uh, Cisco, U.S. Foods, you know, those, those are kind of the big main distributors for food, but they, they have tons of opportunities all the time. You can do everything from working in the warehouse to stocking food to being out on the street selling food to the customers. Gotcha. Um and I'm wondering, I'm, I'm asking for selfish reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying that, folks, you don't know this. My son's just completed a culinary program. <laughs> so <laughs> let, me just, let me just step in here with that to, to make it clear why I'm digging a little deeper here. So you complete a program. You decide a restaurant's not for you. Food brokers is one option. Um, you know, food, food manufacturers, food distributing, 
food writing, um, you know, food testing. There's there's always opportunities for people to to test products and be kind of like quality assurance people. Um, you know, they those aren't always the highest paying jobs, but it's a great alternative to kind of the grind of the restaurant business. And, and there's of, of course the YouTube star uh, who's prepping food for a market, showing people how to do it, yada, yada, yada. Uh, anything else that I haven't asked about that I should? Well, you know, I think anybody who is either looking to get in this business or looking to improve their skill set, the biggest things that I would suggest is, is again, really learning your craft because the two things that I see continually throughout my business and throughout helping my clients is that you either have, regardless of the food business, whether it's a food truck or a grocery store or a restaurant or a hotel, whatever it is, you either have business people that don't really know food, their food just sucks. They're just, it's terrible, but they make a ton of money. Um, people are not going to go back there. That's not going to become a hot spot if the food is not great or the service is not great consistently. So what I would suggest to people is find a way to blend your passion for food and your talent and your knowledge with a way to make money with it. Now, if you don't want to work those hours, there's a lot of different ways of going about that. You know, you go work for some of these, these companies, whether they're food manufacturers or equipment manufacturers or rep agencies or brokers, there's a lot of different opportunities within that, whether it's just working in an office or running samples to customers or taking orders. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different options there that allow you to be in food, but not necessarily of food um, is kind of the way I like to say it. But the key to all that is really networking, building your network, going to trade shows, volunteering your time um, for different events, going out and meeting people, working with people, because the more you do that, the more you'll be aware of what opportunities are out there and where you might fit into all of that. Thank you, Sean. How can people find out more about you, buy the book, all that sort of stuff? Well, you can. Uh, the best way to look at me up is probably uh, businesschef.org. That's the website for the podcast that we run. Um, you can also look up firsttimerscookbook.com. That's, that's another option there. Um, or you can find me on all, any of the social media, uh, Instagram and Facebook, where it make food, make money. We are uh, on Twitter, Chef Sean B. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn at Chef Sean Boucher. So yeah, absolutely reach out to me. I, I'd love to help. I'd love to be able to impart any wisdom or guidance or make connections for you. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm all about helping people in this industry because I think the the stronger we make each other in this industry, the stronger our industry becomes. And that's Boucher, B-U-C-H-E-R, folks. Yep, S-H-A-W-N-B-U-C-H-E-R. Sean, thanks for making time. And folks, I'll be back soon with someone else and more podcasts and videos to help you land work. I'm Jeff Alpin, The Big Game Hunter. If you're interested in my working with you one-on-one -on -one as a coach, reach out to me through my website, thebiggamehunter.us. I've got thousands of posts there, more than 7,000 as of this recording that you can watch, listen to, or read that'll help you find work more quickly. Hope you have a great day and take care.